You're listening to an archived Cabral Concept podcast. After listening to this show, check out the most up-to-date podcasts available at stephencabral.com slash podcasts or search directly on iTunes. And now, welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner, Dr. Stephen Cabral, shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurvedic healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. On today's Weight Loss and Wellness Wednesday, we're going to be chatting about five sneaky food sensitivity symptoms and why you may not have even correlated your current wellness, weight gain, bloating, any of those things with foods before in the past. And one of those reasons is that not all food reactions are the same. Some, the ones that are scarier that we think about when we think of food allergies in the first place are things like peanuts or maybe even strawberries. And what happens is a child or an adult as well can go into a state of anaphylaxis anaphylaxis. And this is a closing down of the airway due to these histamines and inflammation. And it just tightens everything up. And and what we need is an EpiPen or something like that to pull that person out of it, which is a big shot of adrenaline that opens up, it vasodilates, and it gets that heart, lungs, pulmonary system, and the immune system to kind of calm back down. But really, that's the big food allergies that we're talking about that we usually think about. But what about the food sensitivities, which means when you eat certain foods, It's not literally going to kill you, but what happens is it slowly poisons your body over time. And when I say poisons, what I mean is that even though they're healthy foods, that when you put them into your body, they create an immune-based reaction. And when they create this immune-based reaction, it starts to weaken the overall fortress of your body, your body's defenses. So I'm going to share with you some of the ways that you may not have ever thought about how certain foods can actually affect your overall health and for some people, cause them to gain weight, bloating, cellulite, all of those different things. And so now, I think by now, most people have heard like, well, dairy can sometimes cause diarrhea or gas or bloating. Some people think of food sensitivities in general as maybe nuts or something like that. They get itchy skin or they have shellfish, let's say like, or maybe they have lobster and they get hives, right? So you think of that, like those are the normal food sensitivities most people think about. So you eat a food, it's not an allergy, which means like it's not a total allergen that literally could put you in a state of anaphylaxis, but you have an allergy, you have a sensitivity, a heightened sensitivity that causes the hives, it causes the itchy skin or it causes diarrhea, loose stool, gas, bloating, those types of things, okay? Now, some of those are strictly because of the sugar in the food, meaning like if someone eats dairy and then immediately starts to get bloated or they have diarrhea, a lot of times that can actually be a a lactose-based issue or one of the fructose-based molecules inside of the milk itself. It may not actually have to do with a protein. And when we're talking about allergens, we're really talking about the proteins. We're not talking about the fat and we're not talking about the sugars. Those can do their own thing, but not really in terms of causing an actual sensitivity. And those proteins, that's called an actual IgE reaction. Now, I know the word immediate does not begin with an E, but when you hear IgE, I want you to think about an immediate reaction. That is when you eat the shellfish, the shrimp, or you eat lobster or some type of crustacean, and you get hives. You get the skin itchiness, you get the redness, you get the red ears, those types of things. I don't know if you ever knew that before, but sometimes you eat a food and your ears get bright red. That's a histamine-based reaction. That's a reaction to foods as well. Now, that's on an immediate level, okay? So what I try to teach is getting more in touch with your body. You need to understand how your body reacts with its environment and even healthy things as well. Just because it's so-called healthy doesn't mean it's healthy for your body necessarily. So in my practice, we do not test for the IgE reactions because we get people more in tune with their body. And then they're able to realize that when they have this particular food, they do start to feel some of these sensitivities within 20 minutes, an hour, two hours, three hours, whatever it might be the same day. But what I want to talk about today, and again, I've chatted about this in the past, but I've never given you these five specific symptoms. So we're talking about a delayed reaction, an IgG reaction. So IgG, immunoglobulin G, it's different than the IgM 
or the IgE, which we were just chatting about. This is an IgG. That means 24 hours, up to 72 hours after you eat a food, you're reacting to it. So today's Wednesday. So if you're listening to this on Wednesday, foods that you ate on Monday can be reacting to you today. Now think about how challenging that is to try to figure out what you ate on Monday. Like what was Monday's breakfast, Monday's lunch, Monday's snack, Monday's dinner. And then think of all the components in those foods and any different spices as well. Because any one of those things could cause a food-based sensitivity. And what is the sensitivity? Well, it means that your immune system is again reacting to something in that food, one of the proteins, okay? And the proteins, again, are consisting of amino acids. And it's looking at those amino acid strands. Those amino acid strands can actually be inside the stomach, inside the intestines, or they can actually move out of the intestines because of increased gut permeability, which, again, is just pervasive in the environment because most people, by the time they reach even, let's say, 10 years old, have had antibiotics, they've um, had poor food combinations, fried food, they've had stress, they've had heavy metals in their body, they've had environmental-based triggers. And then as an adult, you've maybe used more pharmaceutical drugs, alcohol, all sorts of different things. Uh, Birth control with women is going to open up that gut wall, increasing what's called that the, the limit appropriate gaps. So when those gaps begin to open, now instead of single amino acids, smaller amino acid strands coming out, we have these larger amino acid strand proteins. And those proteins then come right into the bloodstream. And since about 70 to 80%, some people say 85%, we'll just say about we'll say 80%, right? 80% of immune system lies right outside of the intestines. And the intestines are about 26 to 28 feet long in most people. So that's a lot of surface area. If, literally, if you were to flatten out the surface or the, your entire intestines, it would literally cover an entire tennis court. Think of that. Think of the size. That's just from inside your stomach. That's just your intestines. And that's because there's villi, there's microvilli, which is called the enterocytes. And if you flatten all that out, it covers a tennis court. It's remarkable. And that's where the majority of your immune system is. Well, that's supposed to keep you healthy, safe, and strong. But what happens is when those become damaged, the, the villi, and they become blunted, And there's these crypts, which is basically openings below the villi that then can leak out into the bloodstream. What happens is our bodies then create an immune reaction to these food strands, these protein strands that shouldn't be there. So now let's talk about what some of those symptoms are from an IgG perspective that you may have never known about. Again, we test for these, but you can start to keep a journal too and start to look at, well, every time I have chicken or every time I have eggplant, yeah, two days later, no matter what it's with, I get X. And now we're going to talk about those symptoms right now, okay? So one of those, and I I call them sneaky food sensitivities because you could have been relating these things to a hundred other things, but they absolutely can be related to foods that you're eating and healthy foods as well. All right. Food cravings, that's the first sneaky symptom. So most people think that, oh, I have food cravings because I want the sugar or I have food cravings because I need that food that is really good for me. You know, this intuitive eating we've been talking about, oh, well, my body's telling me to eat chocolate, so it must need the magnesium and chocolate, so let's eat that. And I laugh because, you know, I've made those recommendations before as well, but the truth is this, that when you eat some of these foods and they're not good for you, it's called an antigen-based reaction. So these antigens, that's what your body sees when those proteins start to come in from the foods, the protein of the food. And again, all foods have proteins in them. Some are obviously just smaller than others. So when we're looking at it, your body creates antibodies to these antigens from the foods, and it creates more than enough. So the next time you eat them, you're already primed and ready to have sometimes a larger reaction. That's why in my practice, when we do food and reintroductions, we have that food twice, either two days in a row or twice in one day, because it's the second time it's introduced that sometimes then we have that reaction. Well, your brain and your body and your nervous system all seem to be, this is some of the latest research, all seem to be primed to get ready for this next food, the next time this food is introduced, even though it's not a good food for you. And it actually creates and opens up receptors in the brain. So we know these things called, they're like opioid-based receptors, and there's some for casein and dairy, there's some for gluten from wheat, and even though our body knows innately that this is not good for us because we've literally created antibodies, we can get a stimulus in the brain, which is asking for that particular food. One of the biggest ways that I see this all the time in my practice 
is with candida overgrowth and yeast overgrowth. And again, we lab test this all the time. So this isn't just someone saying like, oh, everyone says it's always candida. Well, you know, a lot of times it is. It really is. It's because people get antibiotics. And guess what overgrows when you use antibiotics, even if you were eight years old and had them? right? And you, you're 38 today. It can still be there. You had candida overgrowth. You had yeast overgrowth. Why? Because as you're wiping out the good and bad bacteria, it just gives an easy opportunity for candida. And there's many different strains of candida. It's not just candida albicans. begins to proliferate and grow. And it's supposed to be there. Yes, just not at a prolific level, not supposed to overtake. Now that candida loves to feed on sugar, not fruit sugar, but sugar sugar, you know, in general. And your body is craving sugar for this entity, which is, it's like a parasite. You know, it's not a parasite in the, the framework that we think about it, but it's a parasite in that it lives off of you and it lives off of the foods that you eat, which is why really removing, doing a candida and bacterial overgrowth protocol is so important. And it's why our private clients and of course, everyone online who's been doing it, it's one of our, our biggest things, gets tremendous results. And it's because they're basically just bringing their intestines back to square one, rebuilding the back up from the ground up. And it, and it works fantastically well. So just don't be surprised if you're craving a food that that could actually be a food sensitivity. It might not be a health food for you. All right, number two, another sneaky food sensitivity is fatigue. Now, yes, it could be because you only got four hours of sleep last night. It could be because you're overly stressed. It could be because your HPA axis or your adrenals are not functioning how they should, or maybe you have low thyroid. There are a lot of reasons, but one of those reasons is when you eat foods that you are sensitive to, and again, it can be healthy foods, it could be almonds, right? I test people and they're sensitive to almonds. Well, what happens is the body creates inflammation as well. That inflammation is systemic. It goes from the gut without a doubt, but it also travels into the body, the muscles, the tissues, and your brain. And so if you have that brain fog, you have that fatigue, your body's actually working hard from an immune-based level. Maybe it's producing additional cytokines, white blood cells. Maybe it's producing additional histamines. All of these things, I mean, think about it. When you take Benadryl, you get kind of tired, right? For a lot of people, if you've used Benadryl before, well, the same thing can happen naturally within your body. When I was overseas and eating a lot of new foods, and again, because I was learning to cook, uh, and again, I'm not a chef, but we did some cooking classes too as bonuses later at night for a lot of the interns and residents who were there. And I tried out a lot of different things and a lot of the spices because again, like I just have a history of mastocytosis, which is, you know, just crazy histamine based production that's all under control today. I mean, I don't even have any allergies anymore, which is remarkable for me to be able to say that since I went well into my early 30s with that, that um, they're all gone. But my body went on overload when I got all of these Ayurvedic curry-based spices and everything you know, into my body, and I've been doing that for days at a time. So just, just think about it. Your body can be actually having an immune-based reaction causing that fatigue. All right, number three is anxiety or what feels like almost like a panic attack, heart palpitations. Your heart rate literally speeds up. One easy way to test for food sensitivities as well, this is more of an IgE level, is to look at your heart rate before and after you eat. That's a really nice way for an IgE reaction. However, you can get anxiety or that feeling of like tightness in your chest days after you ate a food. And this can actually be from long term. This is long term now. You keep eating the food. Cortisol and HPA axis dysfunction. Well, what does that mean? Well, when you eat a food that you're not supposed to, your body starts to produce adrenaline. All right, it's, it's, Again, it's mounting a fight or flight based response to this foreign antigen now coming into your body. Cortisol then begins to follow suit from adrenaline and your heart rate starts to get revved up. Your body starts to feel constricted. That can start to cause this cycle of anxiety. I mean, that's a, it's a big one too. And I've seen this quite a bit as well. Usually it's not the full picture, but certainly a big part of that picture as part of it because mineral deficiencies can be a big part of this too that we look at with hair tissue mineral analysis. Okay. Number four is joint pain. So again, work with a lot of people with rheumatoid arthritis, work with a lot of people in my practice, which is overall mystery joint pain, gouty arthritis, different types of things like that, where it just kind of comes and goes, moves from joint to joint, muscle to muscle. Well, I'll tell you this, just from personal experience, for an odd reason, again, it's not everyone, right? But when I eat too many nightshades, and I've spoken about this on past Cabral concepts, when I eat too many nightshade-based vegetables, the peppers, right? Because they're so good for you, right? The cayenne pepper and even tomatoes. And what about eggplant and goji berries and things like that? When I eat too many nightshades, all of a sudden, the first knuckle on my thumb starts to become a little painful. 
if I keep going with it, you know, meaning like, oh, I'm just going to eat a little bit more, whatever it might be, or now I'm going to add a little bit of gluten to the mix, a little bit of bread for my cheat meal, the next knuckle, my second knuckle up of my thumb starts to get stiff and they start to get painful. And so this is something that you look at, whoa, from a, from an innate standpoint, meaning like my body, because again, this is where bioindividuality comes in. My body does not like nightshades for most people, meaning like more than 99 out of 100, no issue with nightshades at all. I never have to, I mean, hardly ever have to remove them from a wellness client's protocol. I would never remove that in the beginning because I don't want it to be too strict of a nutrition plan. But for some people, and cause joint pain. Now it's not just night chains. That was my own personal example. And of course, just go back on the Cabral concept, stevencabral.com forward slash podcast. And you can see my show on night chains as well. We'll try to link that up in the show notes today. For today's show, just go to stevencabral.com forward slash 502. We'll link all those up for it to make it a little easier for you. Okay. So for others though, you know, it's gluten without a doubt. A lot of my wellness clients who have rheumatoid arthritis, they can't have gluten. If they have gluten once, no big deal. They start to have it multiple times in a week. All of a sudden, it just starts to build up. That's a lot of what my new book is about as well, is that, hey, a lot of these things in isolation, no big deal. When they start to add up, when they start to creep up in your diet, then all of a sudden, these symptoms come out. And you're like, oh, well, I I never knew. It just it came out of nowhere. Well, it didn't come out of nowhere. It's been gradually building up. And I think that's what we find is there's just this gradual building up over time. All right, this last sneaky symptom, rosacea, acne, skin-based rashes, these little red bumps kind of all over the body, all over the cheeks, or these hot rashes. People look at them and say, I don't know what this is. It must be hormones, right? Or maybe it's that fried food that I ate. That could be it. And it could be. You know, it could be hormones, could be estrogen dominance, could be too much testosterone, without a doubt. I mean, it absolutely can be. But a lot of the time, It is these food sensitivities that are causing these skin rashes, especially when it happens on the cheeks in young kids, especially when it happens around the uh, orbital area, the eye area of the face, okay, and a little bit on the forehead. Chin acne, uh, I do agree, is typically hormonal, typically estrogen dominance, okay? But if you look on the cheeks and you're looking on the forehead and you start to look also, not always, because it can be hormones on the back as well, you're looking at food sensitivities. Now, I can tell you a big one. Two big ones, actually. So when you get the white spots under the skin where they just look, it's almost like acne, but it's white bumps. Very, very strange, right? That to me in my practice has almost always correlated with food sensitivities and almost always dairy. Now, the ones on the cheeks and and parts of the body, like in young kids, the red rashes on the cheeks as well, dairy and eggs, without a doubt huge. People don't realize, and I didn't either. I mean, I honestly didn't realize until I started food sensitivity testing about six years ago, seven years ago, meaning like I really made that a part of my practice. Egg whites, the number two food sensitivity, if you can believe it, behind cow's milk. Egg whites, that's why kids still have all these like infants and and young toddlers. They have these food sensitivities to egg whites and they'd be given eggs two, three, four, five times a week, especially if you're looking at like, well, what's a healthy food for kid? Well, what about these egg yolks with all this nutrition? Well, if you're having that with the whites, the whites are twice typically the allergen of the yolks. And that's because the whites actually contain well, what that chicken is going to become, but also they contain more of the allergens. They contain more. Now they have the equal protein, about three grams of for the white and three grams for the yolk, but they can contain twice as many allergens as the yolk. So this is really, I mean, it's very, very interesting to me. And, and we help people get well because really we find these root cause based issues. So we have entire families right now doing the food sensitivity testing kits. They're super simple. We literally mail them out all over the US, Canada, the UK, and you, you just literally poke your finger, the top of your finger or a child's finger, fill it up in a little blood dot card and you mail it in. You get your results back in about three to four weeks. You get a 30-minute call with the health coach that explains the results, explains how to do the elimination diet, explains how to add them back in. Really simple but powerful because you get your own bioindividuality of figuring out what foods you're allergic to, meaning like some people are allergic to papaya, some people are allergic to green beans and you look at all these different things. My recommendation is this. If you do an IgG test, of course, again, I'm giving you the option to do it through us and work with our our team, but you can do this through any, um, well, not any, but you can do this through uh, functional medicine doctors who might practice near you. So what this is, we're we're just trying to make it obviously readily available, but I want to tell you how to do it. So whether you do it with us or you do it with someone else, I want you to eat, unless you're very, very sensitive to these foods, then of course, don't eat them because you're going to eliminate them for life, but you'll want to eat a variety of foods twice 
So the, for the 48 hours before, eat dairy a couple times, eat gluten a couple times, eat eggs a couple times, eat all the foods that you would typically like a couple times so that, that you'll better see if there's a reaction in your own body. But of course, I'm not going to tell someone with celiac to have gluten or wheat, right? So if you don't plan on ever having that food, don't make yourself eat it. I just like to let people know like, okay, you ate it, you tried it, you saw if your body, you ate it twice. If you had that IgG-based reaction, you're just going to do that for about 48 hours before you do your test. So if you do the test on a Monday, on Saturday and Sunday, you'll just have a big weekend of all these different foods. And again, they're not, they don't have to be unhealthy foods. You can just go on our website. You can actually see the 94 foods that it lists. Uh, and again, it's a great, great lab. I use them for my own family. Actually, every one of my family and all their kids have tested their kids for these food sensitivities as well. Uh, I test my own kids to just make sure too, meaning like they, haven't, they don't even eat these foods and they test high for certain things, knowing that from an innate based perspective, their bodies are not supposed to have like cow's milk or they're not green beans, like kidney beans, whatever, like for whatever random reason for myself, kidney beans always test high. I never eat kidney beans. I couldn't even tell you the last time I had a kidney bean because I don't even like the taste of a kidney bean, but I test high. So obviously chili made with kidney beans is not the best thing for my body. Okay. Will I go into anaphylaxis? No. Will I get probably a little fatigue that next day or something? Yes, that, that will be one of my things. Okay. So anyway, really straightforward. You can run this IgG food sensitivity test. Of course, just go to steamcabal.com forward slash 502. We'll link up ours. Of course, you never have to purchase from us, but you can at least look at it and then you can say, okay, does it make sense to get it here? Or should I do it with another functional medicine doctor um, near me? That's absolutely uh, positively something you can do. Uh, Another thing is just start using a uh, daily digestive enzyme with whole food meals, not with your smoothie in the morning. You don't need to do that. It's already been blended up, but you can do it with your whole food meals. It'll break down those proteins to smaller amino acids. That will help as well. Good first step. Now, another deeper step would be so doing something like the, the candida bacterial overgrowth protocol and just rebuilding your gut. But if you don't have any gas, you don't have any bloating, you don't feel like you really do have any type of bacterial overgrowth, then you can just move right to the gut rebuilding protocol, which is that glutamine, the zinc, all of that good stuff to help rebuild that gut wall. I still do that twice a year. I consider myself to be fully healed. I consider myself to be feeling better than ever, but I still do that because it's so simple. And all I do is add one scoop to my smoothie in the morning. So I don't need to do any extra supplement like timing. I just add it to my smoothie. Pretty much everything is done right with breakfast and then do it at dinner. I keep my life pretty, pretty simple. Just again, it works for me and we can customize things as needed for the individual. So hopefully that helped. I try to give you as much information as possible but really those five symptoms, you may not have correlated with food sensitivities in the past. I hope you can see now that the foods that you're currently eating, even if they are healthy, could lead to these specific issues. Thank you everyone for tuning into another Cabral Concept. I appreciate your listening and please always do feel free to share it with anyone you believe it could help. Ever wonder what the best sauna, blue blockers, sleep trackers, wake lights, salt lamps, or other health gadgets are? Or what about the top non-toxic mattresses, sheets, soaps, bath products, toothpaste, and cookware? Or would you like to know the cleanest choices for hemp parts, meal delivery services, supplements, and much more? I personally curated, researched, and now created a resource page of all of my top picks that continues to grow each week. These are the exact products I use in my own life, with my family, in my private practice, and they're the ones I trust. To find out all of my up-to-date recommendations and all the details, simply head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash resources.